Welcome to Healthcare Du Jour, where we dish up and digest the latest in healthcare. For the next 30 minutes, sit back as we bring you insight, commentary, and discussion on trending topics to the table, all expertly served up by our host and his guests. Healthcare Du Jour is brought to you by High Tech Answers and Healthcare Now Radio, part of the Health IT Answers Network. The broadcast is sponsored by the Law Offices of Myrick O'Connell. And now here is your host, Matt Fisher. Welcome back, and thank you for joining as we dive into the hottest topics in healthcare. I'm your host, Matt Fisher. On the menu today is Dr. John White, the Deputy National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at the Office for the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology. Welcome, Dr. White. Thank you so much, Matt. It's great to be here. I know. It's great to be able to chat with you. It's, um, you know, I, I think everyone knows that ONC has been very active, um, but before we dive into kind of some of the activities you're involved with, would you be able to give us a little bit of a background about yourself? Sure. Um, so uh, I've been a public servant for the last 12 years. Um, uh, for the last two years, I've been at ONC as the Deputy National Coordinator. Uh, prior to that, for uh, 10 years, I was at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, where I led the Division of Health IT, uh, did a lot of great work with a lot of uh, amazing investigators investigating how to um, uh, use health IT to improve healthcare. Uh, prior to that, I was a practicing family doctor, uh, delivering babies, taking care of people in hospitals, and uh, seeing people in my office. Uh, and uh, part of the time, I was also the chief medical information officer at Lancaster General Hospital, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That's a, a great background. It's um, so what what drew you to move from being a practicing physician to going into public service with the government? Uh, great question. It, it, I didn't have a plan that led me to there. It, um, so, um, you know, I, I went to medical school, you know, full intention of being a practicing family doctor for the rest of my life. Um, uh, went through my training and, and um, um, uh, you know, started as an attending doctor uh, and realized that um, uh, I love delivering, you know, great health care, um, but that I needed great information to deliver great health care and, you know, information not just on, you know, patients that were coming into my office and, you know, what had happened to them recently or in the distant past, but, you know, information about, uh, you know, latest scientific knowledge, latest practice recommendations, um, what was happening across my panel of patients. And, um, you know, came to realize that uh, we were in a place where we could do better with that in healthcare. care. So, um, started getting into it in my practice and in the, uh, the, the organization uh, where I practiced. And um, uh, then an opportunity arose to uh, move back to the D.C. area, which is where I grew up, uh, and uh, join uh, the federal government. And uh, that's how it worked out. So uh, given that, it's, as you were describing, you've been involved with um, you know, informatics and you know, information systems for a, a period of time now, have you seen kind of uh, those systems evolve uh, since, as you were describing, you got into it in the actual practice realm to now being on the, the regulator side? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'll talk a little bit about what's different, and then I'll talk maybe a little bit about what's the same. Um, so, you know, what's different is that, you know, truly, I described it, I described it as a sea change. Um, the last eight years has witnessed um, uh, the almost total transformation of the delivery system from a paper-based one to a, a digital one. Um, uh, eight years ago, 17% of doctors, 9% of hospitals uh, had electronic medical records. Uh, this year, it's 78% of doctors and 96% of hospitals. So, uh, you know, we've gone from the clear minority of folks having these information systems to the clear majority. That's really exciting. That um, brings with it a lot of growth opportunities um, and um, uh, a lot of uh, potential to do things that we couldn't do before without this information system. You know, what, what hasn't changed is, um, you know, both the need and the interest of um, clinicians and patients for good information and fast, easy access to the information that they need, where they need it, when they need it. Um, you know, when I was, uh, uh, you know, growing up in medical school and um, in my training, 
Um, we had some information tools at our disposal. Um, uh, with Medical School at the University of Virginia, we had a medical information system there uh, that we could go to and pull up lab results and things like that. Um, but you know, didn't connect in the ways that you that you necessarily thought it should. Um, when I was uh, starting in my residency, uh, you know, Palm Pilots were all the rage. So now you can <laughs> uh, and we had uh, an application that we used to keep track of um, our patients on service um, uh, in, on on our Palm, um, and um, you know, uh, but now you know, with the increasing prevalence of digital tools in our society more broadly, I think there's been a, a clearer acceptance and drive towards getting those things into our, our delivery system as well. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to kind of break that that response back in, into two different parts. I think one, which which is the first part you went into, which is the, you know the clear accelerated adoption of electronic records and electronic tools, which you know I think. I don't, or I don't. I hope not many people would argue with it, but it seems like that was largely driven by the meaningful use program. Uh, so, from that perspective, kind of coming at it from that thought, what, what would you view as some of the biggest successes out of meaningful use? Sure. Um, uh, so, the Medicare and Medicaid EHR incentive program, uh, uh, which is uh, you know more commonly referred to as meaningful use, um, has been the the clear driver. Um, uh, prior to 2009, which is when the Recovery Act, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act passed that uh, contained the provisions for the incentive program, um, uh, one of the clear barriers uh, cited frequently by um, providers and by hospitals was the cost of uh, buying into these systems. They said, look, this is something that we know we do. The Institute of Medicine has recommended that we do it. Um, uh, we know that we need to get there, but the cost is, is an issue for us. Um, so uh, the Recovery Act passed, and Congress said, you know what, we're going to help you with that cost. So um, that an incentive program is just that. It's not a requirement that uh, Medicare or, Medi or Medicaid uh, providers or hospitals um, uh, use electronic health records, but uh, if they chose to do so, and do so according to a set of criteria, which is commonly known as meaningful use, uh, they could get incentive payments. Um, and um, uh, frankly, it was a pretty successful program. Thirty-five billion dollars in incentive payments paid out, and the adoption numbers that that, that I told you before. So, actually, I'd, I'd like to key in on one piece you just said there, which is I agree with you. You know, obviously, the 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 incentive didn't mandate that you had to participate, but I guess practically speaking. Do you think providers really saw an option since there was the penalty associated or somewhat down the road if you did not participate? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there is not only an incentive provided uh, if you you know if you participate in the program, but uh, in the out years of the program, starting actually just a, a year or two ago, um, uh, providers uh, would steadily get penalized uh, if they did not use. Um, uh, electronic uh, medical records or electronic health records. Um, so, uh, so there was a disincentive to uh, not uh, participate in the program. Um, so, the the incentive program is still in place for hospitals and for Medicaid providers. Of course, it is uh, going to be replaced in the near future uh, by um, the merit-based incentive payment system (MIPS). Uh, or APMs under the MACRA uh, legislation. So, um, so that has been rolled into that. Um, that. That rule, of course, is pending. So I can't yes. say exactly uh, how uh, how uh, uh, the um, the use of electronic health records plays into that. But stay tuned. It's coming soon. Yes. No. I know that they said by November first, the latest, with many hints that it will be coming prior to then. But I, I'm sure many people have a, a lot of reading to do once once the final rule does come out. The good um, reading, good stuff. Yeah. So, and, and kind of understanding that you can't comment on the final rule until it will be officially out. You know. And knowing that, as you just said, that the program will be changing, you know, what are your hopes for the program going forward? And you know, where, where do you see uh, some areas for opportunity to hopefully address um, what have been you know, some fairly vocal concerns by, you know, I'd say, I guess, the American Medical Association and some other um, organizations at, on the provider side of the equation? Yep, uh, great question. So, um, you know, if you look back at uh, the the incentive program uh, over the past several years, you know, it's it's um, you know the, 
program was designed to be able to increase adoption uh, of uh, these information systems um, uh, by the folks that had to buy them, which were doctors and hospitals. Um, uh, that's clearly worked. Um, hospitals were almost at you know completion. Uh, providers were you know well well close to the top of the Rogers diffusion curve. Um, you know we just need to hit that last twenty percent. Um, so my hopes is that uh, we we shift from a phase of uh, you know getting get the flywheel turning with these systems and getting the adoption there and getting people familiar with them to. Um, uh, our, our care delivery system really starting to leverage the power of the information systems in being able to provide um, great outcomes and great value um, for, uh, for for the, the money that is spent on healthcare. Um, you know, the, you know, it's great to have a digital information system, but you you don't do it just to have a box on your desk. You do it. So you have the information where you need it, and when you need it, and it can be shared with the folks that you need to. So, um, you know, things that are on my near-term horizon are a couple things. One is increasing the interoperability of these information systems. Um, we're not at zero interoperability. You know, occasionally you'll you'll hear um, you know a lot of sturm and drong about you know where we are in interoperability, and there's no question that it can get better. But it 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 does happen now. Um, you know, I often tell folks the story of my daughter uh, who a couple years ago uh, broke her finger and we got an x-ray on one side of Montgomery County and then went to the other side of Montgomery County to see the uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And I walked in and into the exam room and sitting there on a computer screen was my daughter's hand, the x-ray. I couldn't believe it. Where did this come from? This is amazing. Uh, and, and they said, well, that's our information technology. So, um, so interoperability is there. It's not as pervasive as we need it to be, and it's not as easy to use as we need it to be. So one is going to be increasing interoperability for a lot of different purposes. The second is going to be to improve the usability of these systems. You mentioned um, uh, feedback that we've had that I've heard very clearly from the provider community that um, um, uh, they want these systems to fit better with their practice of medicine. Um, and uh, you know, interestingly, um, you know. Being an optimistic high guy, I think I'd probably point out to you that none of the provider organizations that you've mentioned or that I talked to say, you know, we should really go back to paper. We think paper is a great idea. We loved it when it was, and I don't know, you know, why we went down this path. Um, you know, I think all everybody who's in care delivery recognizes that these systems have the potential to improve, uh, you know, what we do, and. Um, there are folks who embrace it very happily. Um, there's other folks who have a little bit of a harder time making that transition. And there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, uh, uh, but the bottom line is that you know, we are very interested in working in collaboration, both with the developer community, who obviously has a key role in this, as well as the provider community. They have a very important voice in this, in being able to communicate with the developers who create you know, the software look, here's what we want out of workflow, here's what we're going to need to organize ourselves into accountable care organizations, here's what I'm going to need to be able to measure quality of the care that I deliver across the population, and here's how I need that to work for my practice and for our developers to be responsive to those needs. So we think that's a very healthy dialogue for those folks to have, and um, uh, uh, you know, part of how you do that is you sit down with those folks on a regular basis. I've got a lot of um, great colleagues, uh, both in the developer and the provider community, and um, uh, encouraging those folks and sitting them down at the same table frequently is one of the ways that you make that better. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a, a lot of great points. You know, first, uh, setting out that, and I certainly agree that, as you said, interoperability does exist. It's maybe not necessarily as pervasive or as easy as we'd like, but there is a base that we can get to there. You know, the, the example you gave with your daughter is great because um, I've actually, unfortunately, heard some you know some frustrations with it. My wife is also a, a physician, so she, you know she was saying even within like a broader affiliated network that her organization is a part of, they don't you know they're not all on the same EMR. So some people don't realize that you know notes don't get in there, but it can be accessible. So it's you know I, I think as you were saying that next piece is the interoperability capability is there, but you have to make it usable and you have to fit it into the provider workflow. Um, That's right. 
and in terms of what you were suggesting about you know ensuring that there's a healthy dialogue among all the uh, all the participants in the community you know, can you do you have any examples that you'd be able to share in terms of what you've been hearing and I guess in terms of you know like the the coders and the vendors working with providers since it, it, at least through social media I feel I see a lot of complaints of you know each side feels like they're not listening to the other yeah, um, I think that when you hear comments like that through social media, you know that's a very legitimate outlet for people's frustrations. You know, they're they're trying to find something they can't find it. Grab my phone and I'm going to you know you know text it up and and put it on there. And so it's good. I'm glad that they have that you know that that vent to be able to to let it out. Um, you know, there's a lot of constructive um, um, partnership. Uh, uh, one example that I'll cite is um, the AMA and the EHR Association um, have a usability um, collaboration uh, where for a couple years now they've, uh, uh, those two organizations, American College of Physicians also, uh, and experts in uh, the industrial engineering um, uh, field have sat down together and uh, uh, begun to address what are the issues, that, how do you do user-centered design, or how do you improve on the user-centered design that you're already undertaking? Um, you know, how do you do uh, time motion studies, or how do you help, and, and sometimes it's a matter of helping providers how to better understand the tools they've actually got. I mean, you know, so you and I use, let's, you know, say the common word processor whose name that we shall not call. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, if you go into the bar on the top, I bet you and I don't use 90% of, you know, the different functions that are in there. Um, you know, in the same way, you know, a smart, busy clinician is going to, you know, probably do what they need to do to be able to see patients, but may not take that extra time because they're not aware, you know, to, to, lever to learn those other capabilities that they have of, oh, if I just go to here and I click down there, then I can see all the lab results from the ER from last night, or, you know, over there is the x-ray, right? And so, so sometimes right. it's a matter of, you know, legitimately busy folks not having dog, you know, um, uh, gotten as deeply into their system as they could. You know, here's where both um, the developer, right, who provides educational resources for the provider, as well as actually the professional organizations um, uh, can provide uh, sig significant assistance to uh, their providers. Um, we also uh, uh, have provided technical assistance formerly through our Regional Extension Center program. Uh, funding for that has ended. Uh, that was funding that came from uh, uh, the Recovery Act. Uh, but now we have resources like the Health IT Playbook. If you go to healthit.gov and you look for the Health IT Playbook, there's a lot of great online resources that providers can use to figure out how they use these systems to both improve interoperability as well as fit their workflow better and serve the patients better. Yeah, no, I, one, I think the, the, the amount of resources that are coming out from ONC and other branches of the government to help with a lot of, uh, of these issues facing the provider or the healthcare industry has been tremendous. It's, you know, the, the more information that's out there, I think, you know, it, it's, it's certainly for the better. It, you know, it helps, to, you know, you want to see that there's that actual active dialogue that you're describing going on. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, you know, uh, sometimes it can be overwhelming uh, thinking about the government, uh, you know, the, and, and to be fair, the government's a big place. Um, but, you know, one of the unexpected rewards, you know, I came from, right, you know, I mentioned the University of Virginia, I mentioned Lancaster PA, you know, I've really worked with great people in healthcare and, and really smart, talented folks. Um, you know, the folks in government are amazing. Um, they're right up there with the people I went to medical school with and the people who I trained with and, you know, who I practice with. You know, they're smart, they're dedicated, they're hardworking, and they want to see, uh, you know, the healthcare system get better. They want to see doctors succeed. They want to see hospitals run better. They want to see patients, uh, you know, uh, get better care and live longer and suffer less. And that's what they're in this for. That's, that's one of the really rewarding things I hadn't expected about public service, but that I love. Right. No, I, and I think that's a very fair point because you know, I think the government is often the brunt of even more frustration than you know private companies can be, and it, I, I definitely agree with you that it's often very unfair because you have people who are you, know, you don't have people that are there trying to make life miserable. You have people that are there who want to be there and who are actually trying to improve improve everything. 
I am always open for constructive feedback. Um, I think that you know, I, I think that we got a lot of great input and feedback from our stakeholders, and you know, I, I'm not so set in my ways that I can't listen to you know what we can do better. So look forward to continuing to hear that constructive feedback. Right, and 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 actually, that's a a way to raise one of the things that I've been noticing, which is a lot of the uh, challenges and grants that ONC has been sponsoring. So, you know. One, I think, one of the more recent ones is the, that was in, the winners were announced from was the uh, blockchain, block, yes, blockchain challenge. You know, so yep. on the whole, how have you, you know, how do you view those challenge programs, and um, you know, kind of what, what do you see as the the greatest successes coming out of them? Uh, you know, so glad that you brought those up. So, um, you know, I mentioned that at Arc, I had um, you know, for ten years. Uh, ran a, a research program where we gave extramural research grants. Wonderful, brilliant people come in, um, you know, uh, submit applications, compete for funding, and do some really cool work. Um, and these these were very carefully thought out research projects, and they would take a fairly long period of time, um, you know, you know, years and in, uh, in the making. Um, you know, what's really kind of fun about the challenges is that it's an opportunity for us both to um, uh, introduce a little bit of rapid cycle innovation to what we do uh, in, in the government as trying to serve the public, uh, as well as um, you know bring people in on a voluntary basis. Um, you know, the, you know, for for challenges and grants, nobody has to come in for them, uh, but people do who do are usually pretty excited to do it. And darn, they're they're bright people. They're smart folks. It's, it's great, great folks. So whether there are standards uh, uh, challenges. Or um, interoperability challenges. There's a lot of great ones. You name one of my favorite ones. Um, you know, at, you know, when you hear blockchain, you run the risk of um, uh, of you know feeling buzzword compliant. Oh, that's a right. you know that's a cool techie thing. Um, uh, but you know, honestly, I actually think this is one of the situation one of one of one situation where um, uh, there's some actually really interesting potential applications. Uh, for uh, you know a distributed publicly available um, you know ledger uh, for you know who's doing what and this comes right down you know for years I've talked about um, you know people talk about data ownership I, I very much prefer to use the term data stewardship um, uh, because uh, you know when especially when you're talking about healthcare data there's a lot of people that have claim to a given set of data you know me as a patient uh, me as a doctor, uh, me as a, a you know a plan administrator, um, you know a lot of folks um, uh, you know have appropriate access to health information. Yes. Um, so really, then it becomes less an issue of you know who owns this data, and more of an issue of when you've got appropriate access to this data, how do you take care of it, and and what are your responsibilities to that data and your other stakeholders, um, uh, you know within you know that ecosystem. So, um, you know, uh, you know the, the concept of blockchain plays very well in that construct, um, and um, uh, has proven to be technically fairly um, solid, uh, I would say. So, um, if anybody who hasn't um, uh, had a chance to see the papers that were submitted to us on um, uh, use of blockchain in uh, in healthcare. I uh, really encourage you, again, go to healthit.gov and search for blockchain. There's some wonderful thinking by some real leaders uh, in the tech community uh, on, on how you do that. And if I recall correctly, it said that um, each of the winning submissions was going to be implemented in the real world, right? That is correct. They're working on that right now. So when, when that happens with a challenge, does ONC continue to track um, how the how that actual real world use occurs, or do you ask the people to report back to you? And what's the progression once the challenge winners are announced? Totally depends on the challenge. Um, different ones handle it in different ways. Sometimes you know the field just needs a little boop, push, and you know then they're off and running. Um, sometimes they need a little bit more sustained attention. I think we're looking forward for the blockchain challenge in particular. I think we're looking forward to hearing report, reports back from these folks. Once we get them in, we'll figure out how to you know, appropriately represent them, you know, whether it's on the website or whether it's through an event or who knows, maybe another challenge. Right. You know, so as we're unfortunately already starting to wind down towards the end of our time, I kind of want to ask you where do you see the future of health IT is going? So you know, what, what do you see coming down the road over the next couple of years and 
um, what changes would you like to see occur within uh, the health IT realm? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, yeah, you got to laugh a little bit. Everything's always two years away in health IT, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you know, I'm not sure I can prognosticate beyond two years, but but here's what I'll say. Um, you know, um, you know, we've come to a point where um, uh, health IT is here to stay. Um, it is part of the fabric of American healthcare now. Um, uh, I think that on a very positive note, I think you're going to see um, uh, improvements in uh, the usability and usefulness of these information systems, again, is that dialogue continues uh, you know, between um, the folks who develop software and the folks who buy it from them. Um, I think that as payment policy evolve, continues to evolve um, away from fee-for-service towards value-based purchasing, um, I think you're going to see the information tools and information systems evolve and adapt to meet those needs. Um, I think there's a lot of exciting um, technical development that's out there, and again, at the risk of, you know, um, you know, you know, being somewhere on the left side of the Gardner hype curve, um, you hear a lot of talk about predictive analytics and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, do I know that those things are going to work? No, but you couldn't have done it with paper charts. So uh, you know, it's now 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 we can start trying to explore the use of um, tools like this in, in in healthcare, and I think that there's immense potential. Um, you know, I think that uh, improvements in interoperability are going to continue on. I think they're going to be driven by the market forces. Um, you can't get to better value uh, without better interoperability. And frankly, it's it's you know we owe it to the people we serve to make sure that their information goes where it goes to when it needs to get there. Um, so you know, I think uh, in terms of um, ONC, I, I think that um, you know. Really, we've done our, our best to try to be level-headed and um, uh, give the market room to innovate and grow, while at the same time try to provide a, a, a secure foundation for people who are buying health IT to know that what they're getting does you know certain things, um, and, and that it's real software that you know that's uh, been tested out. So uh, you know, I think we're going to continue to work with both the provider community. Um, and with the developer community, and try to, you know, right size uh, what we do in terms of regulation of health IT. Um, and we look forward to supporting the new administration coming in in the near future, and uh, working with them to uh, you know, carry out their needs. Um, you know, uh, the other you know, part of Washington D.C. is over here on Capitol Hill. Had had a very productive engagement for the past. Uh, year and a half uh, with a number of folks on the Hill. They're very interested in seeing the system succeed. Got lots of advice for us on how to do that. And um, we'll, we'll continue looking forward to working with them. Yeah, no, I, and I think as your comments are highlighting, it's it, it, health IT is definitely an area that's still, you know, arguably in, in its infancy, which means there's a lot of potential and a lot of, you know, as you were calling for, evolution and adaptation needs to occur. So it's, you know, it, it's very clear, as you were saying, you know, since it's very clear you you know you don't have any shortage of ideas or thoughts about what could occur that you know I think it's going to be a very exciting time and that there's a lot to a lot to be looking forward to and you know as I said I can't believe we're we're actually out of time already so I'd really like to thank you Dr. White for a great conversation my pleasure likewise thank you so much look forward to uh, seeing what the future brings us Yes, and you know, maybe a year, a year or so down the road we'll have you back and we can hear you know see see if we are right in terms of um, you know, with the developments that we're hoping to occur have come into place. But I'd also like to, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Uh, keep the dialogue going and connect with me at hashtag H-C-D-E-J-U-R-E. I'm Matt Fisher. Until next time. <laughs>